I'm sure you remember another phrase using zero. The zero of a function. When we say the zero of a function, you are usually asked to do two things. Number one, you are asked to solve. So you do things computationally. But with the creation of the coordinate system, you can visualize, right? Descartes was uh, critical in the development, or Descartes' contribution was critical to the development of analytic geometry, which means you use points, you can use algebra now, you have uh, variables and coordinates, so that you can analyze curves, graphs, lines even. Okay, so if you have the zero of a function, aside from solving for the zero, the zero of a function should give you a definite picture as well. Just like ground zero, just like back to zero, what do you picture when you are asked for the zero of a function? How should it look on the graph if it is the zero of a function? Anyone? Okay, a function, let's just recall. Let's say for this coordinate plane, we have this representation, right? And the zero of a function is, remember, this is the value of x so that y is zero. Okay, so let's go back to the zero of a function. When we say the zero of a function, you know how to do it computationally, but you also have to know how to depict it on the Cartesian coordinate system. That's exactly the purpose of the system, so that you can analyze what is happening to the function graphically, visually, computationally. It's all there. And one big role is played there by the zero of a function. How do you picture the zero of a function graphically? What is the implication graphically? Hmm? The zero of a function, Joseph? Uh, when we say, uh, when we say zero of a function, the graph uh, actually uh, intersects at the x-axis. Very good. Okay. When you say this is the zero of a function, that means at that value of x, y is equal to zero. And if you have something like this, then this, of course, belongs to the x-axis. So if there is a part of your graph with this coordinate pair, then that point lies on the x-axis. For example, if we have a line, okay, if we have a line y equals, let's say, uh, 2x minus 1, you have a linear function and you are asked for the zero. You set y to zero, and then you solve for x. And what do we get? Edita? x is? OK, good. Thank you. x is 1 half. And the point on the graph that goes through the x-axis is? One half zero. So your line is going to go through, okay, this is one. It's going to hit the x-axis over here. Okay? How about uh, if x is equal to zero? Okay. If x is equal to zero, y is negative one. Okay. So you have negative one down here. That's another point, and that's enough for us to construct the line. Okay? This is the line, y equals 2x minus 1, and its 0 is at x equals 1 half. How many zeros do you expect a line to have? Hmm? A line. How many times should a line intersect the x-axis? It goes in 
one direction, upward, downward, it has unique slope. So once it hits the x-axis, you don't expect it to come back. So it hits it once, sometimes, never. When does it never hit the x-axis? Yes. When the slope is zero. Okay, thank you, GJ. When the slope is zero. Okay, now if you have uh, the linear function y equals mx plus b, the slope is m. And when we say slope is zero, okay, see, zero again plays an important role. Zero is important because if the slope is zero, then this line is, okay, good, horizontal or parallel to the x-axis. Okay. And indeed, if the slope is zero, then y is equal to zero x plus b, or y is simply b. So that is a horizontal line. Class, we just made a conclusion about the importance of zero with respect to the slope of a line. If the slope is zero, then clearly that line is going to be parallel to the x-axis, and it will never hit the x-axis, unless, of course, it is the x-axis itself. Okay. Another importance class is this. You remember your trichotomy law, how numbers, values are divided by zero into, well, it's either equal to zero, Otherwise, greater than zero or less than zero. It should be one of those. Therefore, if we refer to slope as that quantity, slope, therefore, is sometimes greater than zero, sometimes less than zero. And a corresponding picture is drawn in our minds. Without the graph, if you say the slope is greater than zero, then you already anticipate once you're going to graph that the line should rise from left to right. If the slope is less than zero, then the graph should go down from left to right. And if your function is a particular quantity like cost or profit or population, then it gives you a very clear picture. Because if the quantity gives you a flat graph, then that means there is no growth. No decay either. There's no increase. There's no decrease. Therefore, there is no change. Okay? So slope is zero. But you have an increase if slope is greater than zero. Here, see, slope is two. If you have negative slope, then you expect the graph to move downwards. Okay? So very definite pictures given by zero as a reference point. Now, if we move on to a quadratic function, what is the graph of a quadratic function? Parabola. A parabola. Good. And a parabola for functions either opens upward or downward. And it depends on what? You remember what you should spot? You look at the lead coefficient. If the lead coefficient is positive, then you know it opens upwards. If the lead coefficient is negative, then you know it opens downwards. Okay? But again, back to zero. If the lead coefficient, of course, is zero, then you're not even in quadratic functions anymore because you go back to a linear function. Okay, so ax squared plus bx plus c gives you a parabola. And then, if you are asked for the zeros of the quadratic function, then it should give you a clear picture of the behavior of the parabola. Even without actually computing, if you say the parabola has two zeros, then the picture in your mind is the parabola will... Will? Rosemary? It will open upwards. Well, if it opens upwards, if it has two zeros, then what do the two zeros mean? When it opens upward, it will? 
twice. Hit the x-axis how many times? Twice. Two times because there are two zeros. Okay? So for two zeros, you have something like that. Okay? Let's say we're only considering parabolas that open upwards. If there is one zero, okay, of course the two zeros are given over there, the points that lie on the x-axis. If there is only one zero, then that's a nice picture too. Because the zero is exactly... At the x-axis. If it's on the x-axis, what is that point, Gerald? Mary Beth. The vertex will lie on the x-axis as so. And then, if your function has no zeros at all, then that should be a clear picture as well. When you graph, the parabola should not hit the x-axis as so. Now, the nice thing about the partnership of uh, the Cartesian coordinate system and your computation is this. You have a check and balance. If your solution says you have two zeros, and then you graph, and when you graph, you get something like this, you should know right away that something is wrong. Because my graph did not hit the x-axis twice. So I might have drawn it incorrectly, or I might have computed incorrectly. The two should be consistent. That's analytic geometry for you. You use algebra partnered with geometry, thanks to Rene Descartes and the Cartesian coordinate system. Okay. Now, if you have a parabola like this, there is another very nice interpretation of the vertex. If it opens upwards, then it is a minimum point. If it opens downwards, then clearly that is a maximum point. Okay. And that is also achieved easily with the help of zero. How is that achieved? You know that the tangent line at the maximum or at the minimum is supposed to be horizontal. So at the minimum or maximum point, you know the tangent. Another way of saying horizontal using zero. The tangent. has what slope? Our word for the day. Zero. Zero. The tangent is horizontal, so the tangent has zero slope. Okay. And if you're already at that point in your studies, then you can get this easily. Okay. The tangent slope is arrived at easily using A derivative. Okay. So what does it mean? If the slope of the derivative is zero, then you're hitting a maximum or a minimum. If you see this, there's a decrease, then you already know what's going to happen based on what you know from lines. If there is a decrease, then the slope over here must already be negative. There's a rise over here, the slope is positive. So you'd know also right away based on your uh, analytic geometry, if you have a point over here, then the value of the derivative, in other words, the slope of the tangent must be positive. So computationally, if you take this x, put it in your derivative, you should not get the negative, and neither should you get zero. Because the graph says, if you graph correctly, the graph says it should be positive. So if you're going to analyze a quantity with this as its uh, representation. You'd say that there is an increase in the quantity over here. There is a decrease in the quantity down here. If you refer to it as motion, there are many motion problems. Let's go to an application, just in case it's not so clear in this manner. If we go to motion, okay, if you start, there's zero velocity. But when velocity is greater than zero, Sometimes that is referred to as movement to the right. And if it's negative, it's movement to the left. Right? Gravity is a rate of change. Acceleration is a derivative of velocity. Now, why is acceleration due to gravity given a negative 
value. Hmm? Well, uh, sorry, velocity is negative. But acceleration, of course, is uh, increasing as it approaches the Earth. However, velocity for free fall downward is negative. Why? Because velocity, by definition, is... You remember the formula? Distance over time. That's a change in distance over time. And if it's negative, that means there is a decrease, just like slope. Distance is decreasing over time. So if something drops, velocity should be negative because it approaches the ground. Okay. So there are a lot of pictures given by being zero, being less than zero, being greater than zero. In a business situation, you'd be very happy if you get this graph for profit because you are given a particular value so that profit is maximized. If you have something like this, you'd be very happy to know this if this were a cost function. Then you'd know where the minimum cost will lie. Okay? So whether you have motion or business, then this has very clear applications. Okay? Anything that you can refer to which increases. If you can graph it out in some sort of fashion, okay, whether like this or you go to cubic, quartic, kintic equations with higher degree, as long as the graph moves up, that's an increase. It starts moving down, that's a decrease. The slope over here, the slope is zero. Okay? The slope here? Negative, good, less than zero. The slope over here, positive. positive, okay? And then it moves up again. That means the slope here hits a zero, and then it goes positive again. Now look at the pattern as well, class, as if you were on a real number line. Slope here is positive. You hit a zero before you can become negative. You cannot go from positive slope here and the negative slope without hitting a zero. Pictorially, why is that possible? If you're going to compute, you might not see the difference right away, but thanks to the coordinate system, you can see clearly that if you're going to move up, at some point you have to stop moving up before you start moving down. And that stop, that pause, is zero. It's where slope equals zero happens. So I go up, I climb, I hit a zero, I stop, and then I descend. Okay? I stop descending. I start ascending. Then I hit a zero, and then I go positive. Okay? And this is already an introduction to your studies later on when you even go to a higher degree polynomials, and then you're asked to study not just minimum points, maximum points, but brace yourselves for inflection points, intervals of uh, increase. You can see clearly here that over this interval on the x-axis, you can see a decrease. And then you're going to be asked to identify an interval here of increase. And you say there are two periods in the year that there is an increase over here and over there. There is one period where there is a decrease. And it's all because of the slope, whether it is 0, less than 0, greater than. Okay? But so much for higher mathematics. This is already calculus. No? The story of calculus and zero is one whole story by itself. Meanwhile, we're playing with the role of zero over here, with the rest of the numbers, with the rest of the system. So maybe I should bring you back to the basic operations and the role that zero plays.